This is the Goal Writing Symposium and from the Diagnostic Center. If you could all also make sure that your uh, mics are muted, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So yes, welcome. We are here to present to you our general session for the Goal Writing Symposium. And as I said, we are from the Diagnostic Center North. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all. Thank you so much for saying who you are and where you came from in the chat. I see that we actually have people from all over the state today. Um, I wonder what our most Northern location is. Anyone from way up North here today? Someone's pointing at herself. Who was that? Wait, it ran away. Mendocino County, anybody North of Willits? Mendocino, I saw Redding. And I know we're all the way down south too, so that's exciting. Um, so welcome. Uh, just a quick introduction about who we are and where we came from, and then we will get started for today's symposium. So my name is Tara Mouse, and I am an education specialist and behavior analyst um, at the Diagnostic Center. My name is Cecilia Timmick, and I am an educational specialist at the Diagnostic Center as well. And welcome, I'm Joey Chapman. I am also an education specialist from the Diagnostic Center. I'm so glad you guys are here. I'm Daniel Silverstein. Uh, I'm an educational specialist at the Diagnostic Center and my shirt has less paint on it today. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michelle Kleiman. I'm an education specialist at the Diagnostic Center as well. Hi, I'm Barbara Mino, Education Specialist, and um, I'm going to put a plug in for the Secondary Transition Breakout Session on the 19th. If you're interested, I'm doing that one. Glad you're here. Yeah, so as you can tell, we are all education specialists. We all have different areas of expertise uh, and all are, have come together to create this uh, goal writing symposium and training for you today. And we're really excited. We'll start with just a little bit of housekeeping before uh, we jump in. So today we are really hoping to have a lot of engagement from everyone. Screens on is fantastic. We just wanna make sure that everyone um, is ready. We may use some polls throughout the day and then we will definitely use the annotate function on your Zoom. Joey, will you describe how we show annotate or someone selects yeah, annotate? Yeah, I'll jump in. So when we ask you guys to annotate, we'll be very clear. We know there's so many of us here today, but we'll be clear what group we want to jump in and annotate. And all you have to do is go to the top of the Zoom um, box and you're going to click that black box on the right that says view options. And then you scroll down to the third line down and you click annotate. And then from there you can pick um, text and you can start typing on our screen. Um, and so it's pretty simple. So we'll let you know when we want you to do that. You guys probably all know that because you're doing synchronous learning with kids. <laughs> We're, we're learning as well. And then our other expectations for everyone today, again, to be really engaged. Uh, we love smiling and nodding and nodding, that's a new word, smiling and nodding. <laughs> and you know, letting us know with your facial expressions that you're still here with us. Use those thumbs up, raise your hand, um, use your reactions and you please use the chat. We will continue or we will monitor the chat and try to answer questions as we go through today. So use that. 100% we're open to that. Um, and again, questions I think best are through the chat today, given how many of us there are. If you need to have your camera off for personal reasons, find one of those other ways to be engaged with us today. It's a long time to sit and listen. So um, find ways to keep yourself interested. A little bit about the Diagnostic Center before we jump into our content for today. So we are um, from the Northern Diagnostic Center. So we cover everything in green, as you see on this, on this California map here. There are three diagnostic centers in California, one for Central and one for South. The primary functions of the Diagnostic Center as a part of the State Department of Education is to provide assessments for students in special education. Uh, we are doing that currently uh, virtually with some consultation assessments and definitely getting assessments lined up for whenever we're allowed to be in person again. Uh, the only requirement for a, an assessment from us is that a student be eligible for special education in between the ages of three and 22. So you can head over to our website if you'd like to look into more information about our assessments. We have lots of trainings that are also listed on the website and everything that we provide is free, um, no cost to family or to school districts. If you have any more questions about Diagnostic Center, you can pop those into the chat as well. I 
and we'll pass this over to Daniel. All right. So um, as part of the Department of Education, um, this is, comes out of the previous director of special education for the state, Kristen Wright, um, talking about a linguistic shift that's happening uh, throughout the state um, as we move towards or as we move into the multi-tiered system of supports. Um, so again, we're referring to our students based on their level of support rather than their disability. That's sort of like the linguistic shift that they want to want to move towards. So you know, call, calling our students, you know, as, as opposed to mild moderate disabilities, you know, mild mod, mild supplemental supports or intensive supports. Um, again. And this is a shift for us too at the diagnostic center. So you'll see us kind of like having to take a pause before we uh, remember exactly which, which terms we're gonna use. But today as we go, go through our training, we'll be using these, um, these new sort of classification terms um, for our students. And yes, as uh, Barbara pointed out before, um, there's much more to come here uh, over the next few weeks. So on March 10th, uh, Cecilia will be leading a, a workshop, a goal writing workshop, um, which will include breakout rooms with each one of us from the Diagnostic Center. On um, March 15th, uh, Joey will be leading um, a session for students with uh, needing mild or moderate supports. Um, on the 16th, uh, this is for students with intensive or functional skills and needing supports. This is with Michelle. And then on the 17th, I'll be leading a, a training for students at writing around executive functioning skills. So learning, going through sort of the domains and then talking about writing goals for executive functioning. Um, Terrell will be doing uh, on March 18th, the data and uh, data design and collection. And then on March 19th, uh, Barbara will be leading a breakout session about um, secondary transition. So you can join us for any one of those using the Zoom links um, and their Padlet is uh, in the chat as well. As we mentioned, um, you can visit our Padlet, which has a ton of resources um, in each of those different categories, um, but also if you don't want the PowerPoint here today um, or uh, any sort of you know case study things that we've used in our trainings, it can all be found on the Padlet. Um, so visit that there. Um, the link is in the chat and also there it is below. So thanks for coming. Uh, we hope you use our resources and I'll turn it over to Joey. All right, so we're here to talk about goals and goal writing and we're gonna keep referencing that goal writing is, it's a process um, and we kind of refer to it as a roadmap for our instructional programs. So we're gonna explain to you the way in which we advise or we recommend kind of going through this process and going through this roadmap in order to create the best and most helpful goals for our students. So we have to know where we are in order to know where we're going and how to get there. Um, so the next slide, it kind of breaks down planning and goal setting. Um, so we start um, with our standardized test scores, but that's just the beginning. There's so much to do after that. We have to start thinking about what other information do we need besides our formal assessment scores um, and how helpful are those other types of assessments and other tools that we'll be using. Um, so we have to think beyond just formal assessments. So, Next slide. Um, so what is it? What else, what else do we have to focus on for academic growth and for real life application? Um, we have to think that California standards, we have to think about those. Um, and we also have to think about discrete analysis or informal assessments, because those are also really, really key as we do our goal writing for our students. We have to be able to identify our students' areas of weakness before deciding which goals and standards to focus on. So we're going to walk you guys through that today as part of our training. Um, so goals are not where we start. And I know that um, that's where we wanna get, but that's not where we start. We gotta follow this roadmap so that we can create the best goals possible. So where do we start? That's what we wanna you know, answer for you guys today. So the framework, sorry about that. 
Go ahead, Cecilia. So <laughs> the framework that we're going to be talking about, like Joey had mentioned, it's a process. And this is kind of a snapshot of what that process should look like. So we've mentioned that the eligibility assessment is the first step, that those are those standardized assessments that um, we all love so much. And they do give us this overall broad picture of where a student is functioning, but they also give us clues as to where to look deeper and where to go next. And that's where we want to go with the targeted discrete assessment. Some of those would be informal. Um, we're going to talk a lot about what are discrete assessments and where do I get that more specific information for helping students? And from there, how do I prioritize their needs? We have uh, students, some that have a lot of needs and we really need to figure out what should be targeted and what can I address through other means of my instructional programming. So we're gonna talk about that and then look at, okay, these are our goal areas. This is how we wanna format writing the goal. And then let's align these goals to standards or determine if it's a need um, coming from a, if it's related to another need resulting from the student's disability. So we'll get into all of that as we go through our presentation today. So eligibility assessment, um, like we have talked about a couple times so far, it is really where we start to determine a student's learning profile and see their strengths and weaknesses. And that is in all areas. So cognitively, academically, with speech and language. And it really gives us clues as to how a student is learning and where we need to dive deeper to look for goals. So what are the other types of assessments? There's so many types of assessment out there, not just our formal ones. We're gonna get into what some of those might look like now. And just a little note about um, one system, um, assessments, how to determine what goals to write. So the new standards also provide potent opportunities for educators to change the way they approach assessments how they develop present levels of performance, set goals, and monitor progress. And this comes from um, one system, Reforming Education to Serve All Students, the report from California's statewide task force on special education. Um, and this is really exciting because it is allowing um, or really putting um, ownership into all students need to have progress monitoring. All students are getting assessments. Um, and there's a lot more discrete assessment out there that are being utilized across all classrooms. So it's not just for students in special education. So here are some of the categories of assessment, the informal authentic assessments, um, student work samples, curriculum assessments, portfolios. There's so many different ways to look at student learning and to really get a real life application of where a student is at and where we want them to be. So one area to get great discrete data is through benchmark assessments. Benchmark assessments are being utilized in almost all schools now to track and monitor all student progress. And it's a great way to see where your students are, to have good benchmark data, and then to monitor it over time and really see specific growth in specific areas. And there are tons of formal assessments out there. We have the Weschler Individual Achievement Test. We have the Woodcock-Johnson the Kaufman Test of Educational um, Achievement, the Pfeiffer Assessment of Mathematics, the Pfeiffer Assessment of Reading, um, the Developmental Assessment for Individuals with Severe Disabilities, and all of the different categories of the brigands. There are so many assessments out there. And oftentimes, as teachers, we only get one test. <laughs> test that we are told to give to all of our students. And it's not necessarily the best test for that kid. So really encourage you to look into what other assessments are out there, talk to your program specialist, talk to your school psychologist, find out what you have access to and um, find out what you want to learn more about because there's a lot of great assessments out there. 
So just a little note about standardized assessments. There is a time and a place for standardized assessments. And the law states that we must have multiple measures of assessment. Standardized assessment is only one way to look at students' strengths and weaknesses. So we really need to look at those areas and assess more, find out more about them. The discrepancy model is only one way to determine if a student has a specific learning disability. There are all kinds of other things that we should be doing to um, you know, really look at how a student is learning, how they're responding to intervention, what instruction looks like, and um, standardized assessments often serve as eligibility assessment, not as a needs assessment. They give us broad information, but we really need to use them as a starting point. Where do we need to find out more information? Um, this area is low, let's go down that path. Um, so that's really what we wanna do with the standardized assessments. And we need to be able to justify an area of need with discrepancy between standardized performance and informal or authentic assessment. So what does a standard score really mean? And does it stand alone? They can be very confusing. So let's take a look at that a little bit deeper. So standard scores, like we've said, are really just a starting place. They give you good broad information about a student's skills. And as you can see here, we have the Woodcock-Johnson subtest. So we have broad reading, a standard score of 73. Broad math, a standard score of 56. Math calculations, a standard score of 70. Applied problem solving, a standard score of 60. And math fluency, a standard score of 50. But what is the real life performance levels with those scores? They really don't mean much unless you know what they actually look like in the classroom or for a student. So for broad reading, this student is decoding at a fourth grade level and they're comprehending at fourth grade with significant support. So that gives you so much more real information than a standard score gives you. Um, with math, they can follow calculation procedures, but they lack basic understanding and there's no mastery of place value. Well, that gives us some information about, okay, here's areas that we can target. It's so much um, more specific and explicit than what a standard score is gonna give you. The other um, thing about standard scores is that they can be very, very confusing. And we have to remember that they are related back to the bell curve. So we have our age equivalent scores and our grade equivalent scores, but parents find them confusing and teachers find them a little bit misleading because they, they don't give specific information. They're not criterion referenced. So we don't know on this standard, this is exactly how a student is performing. And that's why we really need to go deeper and use that discrete assessment to find out more specific information. And I'm gonna pass it back to Joey. All right, um, so what we thought we would do today is we're gonna break up some of this training into four separate case studies. Um, we chose, we made up students that we thought kind of covered, you know, the map in some ways, different ages, different grade levels, different needs, levels of needs. Um, and we're kind of, we're gonna continue to reference these students the whole way through this training. So you can see how we would look at what their standard scores were and how we would pull from those standard scores, which ones we wanna create goals out of and how we would create SMART goals, what they would look like and what our end result would be. So we're gonna be referencing Susie, Jose, Gabriel and Ellen for the rest of this training. So you will get to know them pretty well. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with Susie. Susie is a third grade student. She has a specific learning disability. Um, her eligibility assessment showed that her overall cognition, um, her overall, she has overall average cognitive ability with the weakness in working memory and processing speed. And when she was given the Woodcock Johnson, some of the standard scores that
the lower ones were, sorry, my screen is funny. Okay, the letter word ID was a 66. Passage comprehension was a standard score 75. Sentence reading fluency was a 60 and word attack was a 59. And next you are gonna hear about Ellen. So Ellen is a student who's in fifth grade and we see all of her scores here. She has autism and she also has some significant behavioral difficulties. So there's those uh, that to take into account as well when we look at her standard scores and when we think about assessment and what goals to write for her. So when her eligibility assessment was conducted using the Wyatt, uh, what they found um, were that there's a lot of our, what we found that there's a lot of average scores. So we see that her basic reading and her word reading are strong her oral fluency above average in the, at 100. Uh, but with the areas that we see that are maybe areas of weakness for her that we need to look into a little bit further are her verbal comprehension, which was a 78. Um, and that includes her perceptual reasoning, working memory, and also processing speed. So those are going to be some areas that I need to figure out how those are, are impacting maybe her math fluency. We see she has some low essay composition scores, uh, reading comprehension. So now I need to dig a little bit deeper, deeper and figure out what exactly to target for Ellen. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Daniel. All right, I'd like to introduce you to Jose. Uh, he is a seventh grader. Uh, he qualifies under the federal handicapping condition of other health impairment and a specific learning disability. Um, given his cognitive profile, when they gave him the WISC-4, um, his full-scale IQ uh, was a standard score 107, so within the average range, but he did demonstrate a relative weakness um, in his processing speed, which is a standard score of 78. Um, you know, and overall, his weaknesses are his organization, his writing, and his task completion. You know, we can think of him as a student with executive functioning challenges. Um, in terms of his academic output, 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 there it is, um, his broad reading and broad math uh, were within the average range, but um, he demonstrates deficits in his broad written language. So I want to dig a little deeper there to figure out what's going on with his writing. All right, we're going to introduce you to Gabriel. Gabriel is an 11th grader with intellectual disabilities. His eligibility assessment was the WISC. Full scale shows that he's extremely low. And his dash demonstrates that he's um, averaging a seven, showing a seven years and three months. His weaknesses demonstrates math, reading, writing, communication, functional skills, but his strengths are social interactions, utilizing visual support. And so we again want to dig in those weaknesses and see what we can do to help support him. So as we think through these four case studies, we wanna remember goals are a roadmap for instructional programs, but they're not where we start. Um, after we review the eligibility assessments, we should ask ourselves, what other information do we need? Or in what specific areas do we need more information? Then we'll, we're gonna use discrete assessments to fine tune our understanding of a student's learning profile. By using multiple measures, we can establish present levels of performance to prioritize students' needs as well as determine a goal area or areas. Um, we'll also use the information from discrete assessments to write measurable baselines and annual goals that align to standards. So the tools that we'll use for that, if you look on the DCN Goal Symposium Padlet under the Discrete Assessment Tools column, you'll see some resources that we've shared. As we move through the case studies, we'll review discrete assessments for each of the cases. But here, um, we just listed some broad categories for you to consider. So if you have a student and reading is an area of concern, you might look at an informal reading inventory, you might give a high frequency leveled word list or core phonics survey. For math, you could use a, a curriculum based unit assessment or a math inventory. Uh, from discrete assessments, we get detailed information to write measurable baselines and defensible SMART goals that target a specific need. Unlike eligibility assessments, these can also be used to update progress on goals.
So here are some additional examples of discrete assessments, informal assessments such as checklists, observations, portfolios or rating scales are content and performance driven. Um, they provide evidence and justification for what we want students to learn, how we support learning barriers and how we prioritize skills. It's, impo it's important to note that all of these sources are explicit and defensible data for baselines and annual goals. And in addition to writing baselines and annual goals, you can also use this information to make curriculum choices, choose instructional strategies, or to inform class groupings. We should also consider discrete assessments that are embedded in the technology currently being used. So if you're using programs like iExcel, Quizlet, Dreambox, Read Naturally, or Progeny, to name a few, these are all sources of data that you can use to track and monitor students' progress and skill level. Other sources of embedded discrete assessment could be writing samples from Evernote or Google Docs, work samples from Seesaw, or student videos from Flipgrid. These are all sources for present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, as well as information to write explicit and defensible baselines linked to annual goals. And they can also be used to support students to uh, support student access to knowledge of digital tools. All right, thanks, Barbara. I'm gonna jump back in about Susie. So um, let's dig a little bit deeper into some of the discrete assessments that we would be using with Susie. So based off of those standard scores that we got from her, some of the discrete or more informal assessments that we'd wanna use were would be some that would dig a little bit more into her phonemic awareness and her phonics. So we could use a phonemic awareness and phonics survey and after doing that, some of the things that I learned or potentially I would learn was that Susie was slow to develop blending and segmenting skills, um, but she did have an adequate foundation. Sorry for my typo there. Um, Susie knows her digraphs, but she does not yet recognize them as a unit or blend them as a unit. She consistently demonstrates three short vowels, but she occasionally has confusions with short vowel E and short vowel I. And her high frequency leveled word list, her pre-primer level, she's at about 70% and primer level at about 55%. So from giving the formal assessment, I wasn't able to dig as deep into some of these um, more discrete skills. So this is why we're really talking about how giving some of these more informal or discrete assessments is also so helpful so that when we are writing our goals, they're really, really detailed. So next up, we're going to get to, who is it, Ellen? Yes, it is. Here we are with Ellen. And just a note, there's some commentary in the chat about discrete assessment tools, specifically that there's less for math. So we would love for everyone to engage in the chat and, and talk about different discrete, discrete assessments that you're using or that you have. I know there's a lot on the Padlet as well, but this is a great you know, opportunity to share with 200 people. So what do you guys use for your discrete assessment tools as we're starting to talk about um, the different opportunities and the information? that we get. So for Ellen, we know that she had some good cognitive skills. She had some areas that were in the 70s or low 80s, um, kind of general, those uh, fluency and things like that. So for her discrete assessment, um, first of all, I want to get in and do some observation of her behavior. Whenever there's a student who has behavior issues um, and or attention based issues, really important for us to get in um, and, and get some information about how the student is performing in the the classroom because the the low scores, as someone noted in the chat, could all could be a skill deficit in that area, but it also could be a performance deficit, like they don't test well, or the testing was given on a bad day, or they refuse to, to engage in their testing. So we also want to see them in the classroom environment 
Um, if you're an RSP, if you're someone who supports kids outside of the classroom, we need eyes on. We need eyes on in the environment where issues are happening, whether it's behavior, attention, or academics. So I'm going to go in for Ellen and do some observation. I also am going to talk with Ellen and talk with her teachers. So we, we I think we forget sometimes how helpful interviewing can be as a discrete assessment tool. Um, I know when we have kids that just don't like to read um, or have a lot of negative feelings about reading, sometimes we just talk to them about that and it we can figure out some information from them, from the student voice, what's hard or that they don't like reading out loud because they're embarrassed or whatever it might be. So to figure out some or the math problems, there's too many or they're too jumbled on the page, things that we might assume, but gosh, what if we can hear it from, from the student or from Ellen? Uh, I also want to do some criterion referenced reading assessment. So um, something that's not going to give me a standardized score, but rather something that might give me a more appropriate uh, grade level or again, and let me analyze as the student reads different errors and, and mistakes, and then look at some concrete, uh, looking at the comprehension components. So her comprehension was low, but I want to know, is, is it low because of inferential questions? She has autism, so maybe that's an area we need to focus on. Maybe she's really good at concrete comprehension questions, so figuring out the difference there. Uh, and then for her math, um, someone mentioned the, the key math earlier. Well, it is a standardized assessment tool. It's really lengthy and it's really um, specific and it scaffolds, breaks down all the problems. It shows them visually and gives some uh, verbal cues. So I like to use it sometimes as a, as a discrete assessment to really see what parts of math might be a little bit more difficult. But if I don't have access to that, I could also use just you know something, um, a chapter test, even from like an Envision math curriculum or anything that you have that might allow you to, again, like see where the skills are breaking down um, because we're not looking for a score, we're looking for what skills are the issue. And we're gonna do that in writing as well for Ellen. So then we'll, we'll talk about what we're gonna do about these in a moment, but we'll jump over to Daniel and hear about Jose now. Yeah, so when we think about discrete assessment for um, Jose, again, we're thinking about his um, executive functioning skills and also his writing. So like like Tara was mentioning, uh, observation is going to be a big key. And if you look in our Padlet, um, just in terms of thinking about his uh, EF skills, there's like sort of a um, survey you can you can sort of take or give uh, thinking about a focal student and what sort of executive functioning domain you see the breakdown happening. You know, is it in, is it in his uh, you know, initiation, is it in his organization, you know, where, what area is, 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 you know, he's showing deficits and so you can support. Um, and then just, you know, using curriculum based assessments, whatever you're using for your ELA or writing component, you know, is it uh, whatever curriculum you've adopted, or if you're daily, doing daily journaling with them, you know, how is his, his writing there? Is, where is he getting lost? Is it in his grammar and his function? Um, so all, all that needs to be uh, looked at when you're thinking about him, you know, is it about the spelling? Is it about the sentence formation? Is it the punctuation? Or is it actually the formation of the writing? Um, or is it just him initiating or organizing or planning out the writing? So sort of through uh, behavioral observations, uh, you can get more information to figure out where the breakdown's happening for Jose and start to formulate a goal for him. All right, for Gabriel, some discrete assessments. Again, we go along with the observation. Observation is great data for yourself. Um, also, for, because he is in high school, we wanna make sure we're doing his, his person-centered transition assessment, which is really important to figure out what his plans are for after high school. This is pretty pivotal as you enter and transition through um, your, your high school years. Um, and then also with that trial teaching, you're going to explore his transition in, into work, employment, and life skills. Um, the trial teaching will break it down to figure out where we need to accommodate and modify his instruction needed. And utilizing the Brigance, the comprehensive inventory of basic skills, you're able to hone in on the specific gaps that he might have and provide those supports necessary to be successful. So now that we all have gotten our assessments done, we went and did our discrete as well as our standardized. All of that is great information. We do need to synthesize it so we can go to the next step. And the next step isn't writing goals. Right now we're going to go to the framework. And what we need to do next is prioritize the areas of need. And those areas of need are going to be focused on the weaknesses and building that foundation for life skills, behavioral, as well as academics. And all of that is dependent on your individual students' goals and needs. It's not the same for everybody. That's why this is definitely individualized. And so we want to always keep that in mind while we're considering goals and prioritizing. 
So we're going to prioritize our goals based on their supports needed, and then we're going to determine the goal area. So again, we want to go ahead and prioritize. We're going to focus on the weaknesses, target the current deficits, and prepare our students for our future, well, their future, <laughs> for their future. And it is typical go ahead, to get stuck. Next page. It's typical to feel like you might be getting stuck um, because there's so much data out there. How do we prioritize what data to use, what strategies to use? Someone, you know, someone might say, offer this and suggest that. What we suggest is use uh, evidence-based materials because they've been proven and tested to show improvements if used with fidelity. And also make sure we're scoping and sequencing with our priorities. So that way we're not jumping around and around. And then we don't have that foundation. That's what we want is making sure we have the foundational skills necessary to move forward. Um, next step. So again, we want to prioritize our needs based on all of the questions we're asking ourselves about that particular student. We want to make sure we're focusing on the pivotal foundational skills the current need of that student and what is the next step for them to move forward, right? So we want to provide the student with all the necessary items to be successful. And that leads us to our next thing of adapting and modifying instead of writing goals for everything that's needed. So we really, again, want to look at where do I start and how do I prioritize and when do deficits need go back? When do deficits need to be accommodated versus targeted as a goal? So we really need to consider um, accommodations versus modifications. Does the student just need some tools to help access or do we really need to break that work down, modify and change it in order to allow a student to access the information? Um, scaffolding versus rescuing. So often when a student gets stuck we jump right in and give them the information. And what we really need to do is build in those supports so that students can get somewhere as independently as possible or complete a task as independently as possible using the tools that we're providing them so they learn how to get there themselves rather than always relying on the teacher to kind of jump in and um, rescue them when they get stuck. So we want kids to feel themselves making those gains and learning those tools. Um, universal design for learning should be in every classroom. It is super, super essential to making sure that every student's needs are being met regardless of their learning style, regardless of their learning level. All kids should be able to access information utilizing appropriate universal tools. And we have a great training for that by the uh, Mr. Daniel. He can give you more information if you're looking for more tools on universal design for learning. And then along with that differentiating instruction, we want the content to be the same for all kids, but we're not gonna give every student the exact same level or the exact same problems because we need to make sure that we're meeting students where they are and supporting them to get to where they need to be. So we really wanna switch up our instruction based on students' needs. And then inclusion. Inclusion is increasing around the state. It's wonderful. Um, and it really has proven to increase learning outcomes for all kids, not just students with disabilities, but students without disabilities as well. So inclusion is another thing to consider. And really remember that you are the expert on your own kid. You know your students better than anyone else knows them. and you know what needs to be prioritized. If you really look at the data and you really think about your kid, you know what needs to be addressed immediately and what you can accommodate through instructional design. So use, trust yourself is basically what we're getting at there. Now back to Joey. All right, Susie, here we go. So I know we can all relate. We've all been in the position as educators, as teachers that we have students that sometimes we're looking through these standard scores and we're looking through a discrete assessment and we have the feeling of, 
oh my goodness, there's like eight or nine goals I could write for this uh, student. What do I do? Well, we don't want to write eight or nine goals per se. So what we really want to do, like Cecilia was just explaining, is try to tease out which of these low standard scores or um, informal assessments, discrete assessments that are showing areas of weakness, which ones do we want to create into goals versus which ones can we provide accommodations or modifications for, but not necessarily write a whole goal for. So we're going to start talking about that right now. So with Susie, um, I would choose to prioritize the areas of need and blending sounds into a whole word and I would create a goal about that. And I would choose to prioritize her high frequency words. Um, I know that her reading fluency is also an area of weakness and something that I would want to address. However, if I were to choose two of those areas out of the three to make a goal out of, I would choose the blending and I would choose the high frequency words. Um, so on the next slide, what I want you guys to do, and I'm gonna call out, um, I'm gonna call out our mild supplemental support teachers. So our mild mod teachers, elementary level. What I want you guys to do is to go up, click view options in the top right black box at the top of your screen, scroll down to the third line down and click annotate. Remember, this is my um, mild supplemental support teachers, my mild mod teachers, K through five. And I want you guys to annotate on the screen what accommodations does Susie need in order to meet her, her um, fluency area of weakness. We're not necessarily going to write it into a goal, but what accommodations could we put in place in order to meet her need? So if you guys that I just called out could get up there, annotate, and just start typing away on this screen what accommodations you think we could include in her IEP um, in order to help meet her reading fluency weakness. So I'm excited to see what shows up on this screen. I see flashcards, visuals, what else? Increase, something's coming next, I know it. Um, speech to text, yeah, definitely. Oh, my eyes aren't that good. I can't read that little one in the top right. Or is it just a line? Um, audio, so maybe getting books on audio. Leveled readers, these are all really good. Increased size of text, maybe that's an issue. Graphic organizers, look at all of these accommodations and modifications getting slapped up here, I love it. Keep it coming. Again, I can't read that one, my eyes are not that good. I guess I'm getting old here. <laughs> that someone says scribe. Scribe, that's good. Um, Let's give another, I don't know, 10 to 15 seconds to see what else we get up here. Audio passages, yeah. Additional time. Mm -hmm. Allow repeated reading to practice. Absolutely, that can always help with uh, fluency. Break assignments into workable chunks. That is a really good accommodation. We also have in the chat preferential seating, grade separated, from spelling, uh, visuals for sight words, scribe, which I think is on the board. Read out loud. Lots of great ideas. Yeah, a lot, phonological awareness. So you guys, you guys are on it. You guys are seeing that even though I've prioritized the blending and the high frequency words as the two areas that I would create goals for Susie, there are other ways to meet her area of weakness in reading fluency without necessarily writing a goal for that. And that's kind of the big picture what we wanted you guys to take away from this exercise is that we can't write a goal for everything. We just can't. So how can we meet those other areas of needs? We don't wanna ignore them, but we can make a mod, um, accommodations and modifications and even write those into the IEP itself in order to eat, meet those areas of need. So next step, let's see. Next slide, let's, we appreciate all your guys' work on here. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and clear that screen. And as I'm talking, so 
Um, again, those are the areas that we're focused on. Um, and now we're gonna do this for Jose. So Daniel's up next. Oh, Ellen, sorry, Tara's up next. It's Ellen, that's cool. Yeah, so there is a lot of discussion in the chat too about how many goals to write. And there is no like hard and fast rule around that. And it's something that we get asked all the time. You know, we say four to six goals. Um, and yeah, that might include service providers that also, you know, within that four to six goals. Um, and that's why we're really trying, and some kids will of course have more, but we want to really, that's why we're going through this process of really talking about prioritization and that we don't necessarily, or we shouldn't write a goal on every area of weakness. That's impossible for us all to track um, and make sure that we're, you know, monitoring it properly. That also doesn't mean that these are the only areas that we instruct in or teach in, but rather we're trying to, um, figure out what are the, the skills or the goals that are going to be the most effective in helping the student access their learning. So fluency, like the example that Joey just gave, we don't wanna focus on you know fluency and reading faster. Maybe the student is able to access the material even though they're reading slow. So that's why we talked about other accommodations. So if we look at Ellen here, uh, same process that we kind of talked through. So we're gonna prioritize by looking at her areas of weakness. So through that, using the key math and doing some curriculum-based assessments in her math, we specifically found that she has difficulty with place value. Um, and that she has a hard time remembering the steps for math computation. So what comes next, uh, kind of the task analysis or the process for math. And actually the thing that gets in the, in the way the most of her being able to answer things like word problems or more complex problems is her own frustration or the behavior when she gets stuck or when it's difficult. Um, and then in that analysis of her comprehension, we saw that it's specifically the why question that she has a hard time with and in not surprising since she's a student with autism. So when we consider, we've got a lot of areas to look at here, what's most important. Um, I'm gonna prioritize place value because that helps as a building block to a lot of other mathematical skills. Uh, and then I'm gonna focus on frustration tolerance. Uh, so her being able to handle being frustrated and continuing to working on something hard and why questions. Now I'm not targeting the remembering of the um, of the math computation steps. So when we look specifically at accommodations here, I noticed that we're getting a lot of a lot of comments about what teaching strategies to use to teach you know place value or to teach decoding. But let's switch a little bit. I'm not writing a goal for math steps or remembering computation steps. I want to accommodate that because of her low working memory scores. That's not that's something that may always be difficult for her. So what are the accommodations that we're going to put in place so that she can answer or complete math steps? without, again, making it a specific goal. So this is an accommodation, not a teaching strategy necessarily, a little bit different. Visual aids, right, yeah, strategy, and yeah, so like place value blocks and strategies for analyzing word problems, great kind of teaching tools. Uh, but yeah, yes, exactly. So we're seeing more accommodations. Thank you for those. If you're a, uh, also a teacher of the kids that have more moderate severe, um, uh, needs or extensive needs, pop in there what you might do for that student. So student has a lot of significant news. Color-coded visuals, step-by-step notes, exactly. Math graphic organizer, pre-recorded instructions. Yeah, these are all things to help support working memory. Um, so again, I'm going back to that eligibility assessment. I'm going back to the information that I've learned across the whole assessment to not just give all of the uh, general accommodations that we put on IEPs, but rather to make them very specific to what is her learning profile. And we're seeing overwhelmingly here that we need to, again, provide her visuals, visuals, all different types of ways of providing her visuals for that step-by-step. -step. How do I remember the directions? Exactly, you guys have all got it. Yeah, and I just wanna highlight as I'm waiting for people to, to 
to close this up, I'm going to repeat myself for a moment and, and highlight, we don't just write the same accommodations in for all of our kids. That's why we go about all of this assessment and, and looking a little bit deeper, because if it's actually, if there's, all the kids need the same things, that's universal design for learning, right? So this is looking at for that specific student and their specific areas of need, what do they, what accommodations are needed? Great. Great job, guys. So I am going to clear this as I switch on over here. Thank you for using our annotate function. And so then we look at, again, the areas that we are going to identify. So I have these four goal areas, informational text comprehension. And I always tie it to informational text because that's um, really functional in life, especially for our kids that are a little bit more impacted. Behavior, math problem solving, and place value. All right. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Jose. Um, there was a couple of good questions in the chat. I think Joey may have answered them about when someone or an advocate asked for eight or 10 different goals, maybe behavioral goals. I don't know, Tara, if you have a comment there too. Did Joey, you answer that one? Uh, it looks like you did. Um, but yeah, that can be really hard. But I, I, I think that just generally, I think if the if the goals are narrower and attainable, um, as opposed to like just a goal for every area, that's going to be the best practice. Um, and it can be a hard conversation to have. But as the case manager, you can sort of explain that you know having narrow focused goals um, that are really going to be attainable in a school year um, is going to be the best practices um, to support your students' growth. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has anything to add to that, especially as behavioral, Tara. If you have anything to add. Um, yeah, so I think what might also help um, is by is ident or, or helping our advocates, our parents understand how the goals that you have selected um, are maybe a, a stepping stone or a building block to the other skills. So I'm not going to write every behavior goal, but what's the one that's impacting the student or safety the most right now? And remind everyone that if students meet goals before the annual, you can always, not that we always want to, but we can always go back and write more goals. But our, our, our task that we're being given is to write, like Daniel said, attainable goals that can be met hopefully within a year. All right, so I'm going to move on here to talk about Jose um, and prioritize where the, the areas um, that I want to write the goals are. So wh where he's having def uh, challenges is in task completion, right? It's, it's initiation and also sustaining his effort all the way through. Um, you know, he gets distracted, he distracts others, he skips problems, things like that, sort of classic uh, students with maybe an ADHD profile. Um, and also just writing the writing the, the actual function of write over an expression, right? A topic sends with supporting details. He doesn't use transitional words. His spelling, his handwriting, and capital letters are all um, areas of concern. So, what's the most important part? What's my priority here? Um, obviously, getting him started on a task. Um, he needs to initiate to the task. When it's time to write, he needs to begin writing. Um, and then writing a paragraph. Uh, he's in seventh grade. Um, it's time to begin to uh, learn the function of writing. So, I'm going to call out on. Um, let me go to the next slide there on uh, mild supplemental middle school and high school uh, teachers or educators. Um, what sort of accommodations would Jose need to be, you know, to work on, you know, not only his task completion and initiation, but also on the function of writing. So what sort of accommodations would be the best practice for him? Oh, I like writing out there, sitting near the teacher, graphic organizers. On task reminders, you know, get starting. Yeah, visual checklist. Um, I'm a big proponent since we're in dis uh, distance learning that I recommend all the time. If you guys use like Google Keep, which is like a checklist, you know, just making a checklist for the students, like, okay, begin, topic sentence, you know, what's next, what's next, what's next. Uh, visuals, closed sentences, sentence frames, expanded time for completing assignments, speech to text, or text to speech, just one big pink line, um, you know, writing a checklist. Uh, yeah, does he need an OT, sentence stems or starters, self-monitoring checklist, that's great. Word webs, you know, prompts and reminders like, hey, Jose, it's time to get started. Um, all those things are great. Um, yep, 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 yep. And if you come to the executive function training later, goal training, I'll talk about some actual graphic organizers, self-monitoring charts that you can use and initiate in your class. Um, so yeah, that's great. We're gonna move on to uh, you can go to the next one, Tara. 
clearing drawings, Justin, give me a moment. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you. There you go. Okay. And so um, my areas of need are going to be his task initiation. So, you know, initiation is one of those executive functioning uh, strands, you know, when it's time to go, he needs to, to begin working. Um, and then also writing a paragraph. Um, so all the components uh, that go along with that. And, and writing is a really complicated task, especially for students with executive functioning challenges, maybe the hardest task, right? Because it, it, it hits on all the different executive functioning areas, you know, initiating, you know, inhibitory control, planning, organizing, sustained attention, all those things are necessary in writing. So your students who do demonstrate executive functioning challenges are going to struggle with writing and may need some accommodations or some goals. Um, so uh, Jose is uh, sort of profile matches that and you can go on. All right, we're looking at Gabriel now and his areas of need. We have, um, he has some challenges with some rote academic skills and he is utilizing functional academics and he is having a challenge with that. So there's sort of some things to think about while we're planning for goals, but we wanna really hone in on some of these strengths he has as well, which is he, he can identify coins and values. So that's a strength and he can read a clock. Yes, he doesn't understand the context of it and how to apply it, but we gotta think about the strengths and how we're gonna be able to support some of those academics utilizing his strengths, right? Because we don't wanna write a goal for every domain and every need he has. We wanna go ahead and utilize what his strengths are to make sure that it'll support the academics. Now, along the lines, again, he is a high school student, so we need to think about triangulating those goals to his post-secondary goals, which is independence, employments, and life skills. So whatever we're teaching, Remember, rote skills are challenging. We wanna make sure that we're making sure it's fun, it's motivational, and it's attainable within the time frame he's given. So what kind of goals can we go ahead, not goals, accommodations we can support him with to access um, some of his goals, not goals, but his needs. So we're gonna be calling out those high school students, um, high school student teachers who work with students with extensive support need to think about some accommodations for him. And remember, he is great with visuals. And you'll use that annotation button at the top. I like somebody's writing right there. There you go. <laughs> Manipulatives, great. Manipulatives are great for the counting, for um for many different items. Learning how to tra transition with tickets if he has a bus pass. Using learning apps or apps on a phone. Definitely apps are the new thing for everything. You get it for time, sequencing, checklist, right? Checklist could actually be on app on your phone as well. So if you're taking the bus, stepping your sequencing of what you need to do next. It'll help with the memory because the memory, remember? A visual schedule, checklists. I, I'm sorry, I can't read the one on the far left. I, there we go, visual task analysis, visual task analysis. I like task analysis a lot because then it identifies where the gaps are and then we can go ahead and provide the supports necessary to be successful. Extended time reinforcement system with a checklist. Reinforcements are always great. Some like immediate reinforcements, like money on the spot for working, that is amazing. It works wonders instead of having to wait for a paycheck, you know? <laughs> Excellent. I love all these ideas. Thank you so much. So we're going to go to the next slide just to confirm what we're going to be doing for him. Thank you for clearing. And so what we're going to be focusing on for Gabriel, the remainder of this presentation is his functional time and money. And remember, we're always thinking about triangulating at this point. We want to make sure whatever we're doing in academics is applicable to his post-secondary goals. Okay, so we're, we're headed back to the framework. We've made, kind of come to the point where we found to prioritize the goals that we need. So now it's actually the goal writing time. Uh, and we really, really want to highlight all of this assessment that's done before we actually get to goals. So again, we're not having the same goals for every kiddo in our classroom. We're not kind of just going to our go to uh, because we really want to be building individual skills. And we know that's hard and a, a little idyllic, but we 
do definitely want to consider using more of these tools as we've talked about throughout the day to have a little bit better idea of what students need to be successful. So then we're going to talk about writing the goal using a smart format. And the reason that we're kind of hunkering ourselves or rooting ourselves to the smart format is because we want goals to be meaningful and really we want them to be defensible. There's been a lot of discussion about advocates and attorneys in the chat. So we want to make sure that what we're writing is a solid defensible goal based on information that we that we have gathered from our discrete assessments and that they're measurable so we can show progress. And then we'll talk a little bit about aligning uh, those goals to the standards. So we know that writing goals is difficult and that it can often be a little bit daunting. And I'm sure we've all written goals for really interesting things. If we want to throw in the chat, like what's the most interesting goal that you've ever written as a special educator, assuming they're all appropriate, but you know, goals can really cover any, I say that as a behavior specialist, obviously, but, um, we can write a goal for any area of need for a student as long as we can justify that it's a high priority for the student to access their education. Um, so let's look at what that might look like. For us, uh, we would really recommend not using goal banks or at least using goal banks very cautiously. We know that they're helpful. We know that they've been um, sometimes recommended by uh, program specialists and by different administrations. And part of that is I think to try to make things a little bit more defensible to you know, ensure that the goals have the needed components. But it's really easy to skim through goals and choose from there. So hmm, let me see what goes, oh yeah, he needs that kind of goal. But that's a backward process. Remember, we have to write goals that's driven from an individual assessment. So if we talk about defensible, if you talk about an attorney or an advocate who wants to write eight or nine academic goals, if you don't have your discrete assessment and your data, your information to say, look, these are the areas of need. This is where we need to start. And look, this is how we're going to accommodate the other areas in our process. Then you're kind of at the mercy of the, those discussions. So knowledge, data is, is your power in that way. Um, when we want, when we go to goal banks, we if you're going to go to goal banks, please go to them after you've completed your assessment. So you know what you're looking for if you're using them. And then be sure to change the goal a little bit. So, and there needs to be something that's specific to the student. Um, I've unfortunately seen so many goals uh, that still have the like underlined with like blank for where the student name goes and things like that. Uh, so not only do we wanna make sure that all that's filled out, but what needs to be added to the goal to make it specific for that student's level of performance. Um, so when we're writing our goals, what components make a goal defensible when you get to that spot where you feel really confident in your goals? So we want to be sure that you had that informal assessment data, like the actual data sheets. Those should be attached and with the IEP to show how you come to your information. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in data design and collection uh, breakout session next week. We want to be sure that we're, again, attaching whatever interviews or surveys or curriculum-based assessments, work samples evidence. So our baselines are never vague and unclear, uh, as well as our progress, our, um, you know, our progress reports. So the things on the right hand side of the screen are not defensible. We do not, don't, don't do it. Don't write these things into your goals. Um, like things like about, or I see, we see ranges like, you know, he can do it you know, from 20 to 70% of the time, that's not really information that's clear. Um, for you middle school, high school teachers, partial pass or partial progress is not an acceptable baseline or progress uh, report for a student. So why, what, what, what have they partially learned? We need some information there uh, and some description of progress, both in baseline where they're at and um, obviously at those progress reportings. Um, and if you come to the end of the year and the student has not met the goal and you say no progress or goal not met, and then we just roll the goal over again, we're not showing educational benefit because if supposedly we worked on that goal for an entire year and there's no progress or we didn't meet it. So what are we going to do differently to help that student learn that skill? Do we need to change, you know, how we're presenting it? Is it written in, you know, is it too big of a jump? Do we need to back off and create kind of the next step or a smaller chunk? So maybe he can't write a five 
paragraph essay, maybe we just need to work on writing a topic sentence and, you know, three details, something like that. Um, but I know when, when I was teaching and we had our special education evaluation by, you know, the, the powers that be, that was the thing that our district got got dinged on the most was this just kind of goal continue goal continue that shows lack of educational progress so again we want to maybe it's not a goal we can learn maybe we need to accommodate it instead so those are all kind of um the the critical thinking that we need to do in this process uh the bottom line however is to follow your own district guidance when it comes to all of these aspects such as you know how many goals are we writing or um to use goal banks or things like that so if i I'm saying something that's in opposition of your district, go with your district guidance, and then uh, we can talk about it a little bit more if you'd like. If, um, but oftentimes there's reasons for district guidance in those capacities as well. All right, so um, please leave some or put questions in the chat. I see, can you give an example? Can you tell us what you would like an example of? Um, the data collection will be next Thursday. Um, can you, and I'm just catching up. I see that the other specialists are answering questions there. So yeah, I know that's a really big topic area to dig into a little bit. Um, and we can discuss that more too in our, in Cecilia's workshop next week, where we'll, we'll have a little bit more time to talk specifically about situations. Uh, so what goals do I write? We need to, to look at how, uh, how we are actually writing goals. And this is kind of a summary of what we've talked about so far. We want to make sure that our goals um, help the students kind of access the next environment. Are we helping them get where they need to be? Whether it's what do they need to be ready for middle school or high school, or, or what do they need to be ready to do out in the real world? always, always thinking independence. So if they can't, if you've just been rolling over the same goal and they're not being able to demonstrate it any more independently, you know, we need to change something. We need to think about what do they need to be as independent in the world as possible. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is that there's no right or wrong answer. We're actually given a lot of subjective responsibility in this field to decide and prioritize, you know, what is educationally relevant for a student. So don't, you know, there's no right or wrong if you're stuck or you're not really sure. Access and resource the rest of your team members as well, your psychologist, um, your school psych, your SLPs to see if they have some um, opinions too about what goals might be the most salient or the most important for students. Um, and we really also need to remember that this is a team discussion. So if you're not really sure, maybe you come in with some ideas and you really do write it with the team. You know, that is not as, a, you know, it's kind of how we're supposed to do it, but we can definitely have some of these discussions to determine what's the most important when we are prioritizing. And then just a reminder again, to keep in mind those accommodations. Accommodations are not, they're so helpful. They're what, you know, supports a student in learning and their specific as, uh, just as specific as the goals. Um, okay, so here's our SMART goal. Can everyone show us with like a thumbs up or a nodding head if you've heard of the SMART goal structure? Thank you for nodding, Linda, I appreciate it. Wendy's laughing, of course we have. Kendra, great, wonderful, thumbs up. Abby, thank you, Michelle, awesome, cool. Okay, so yeah, exactly. This is not any um, revolutionary you know, thing that you've never heard of before. It's just kind of a reminder that we really need to make sure that our goals fall within that structure of being smart. And we're going to show you examples here of each of our case studies using a SMART goal. Uh, there is some discussion about the order of some of these components and it doesn't really matter what order they go in as long as everything is there. So is it specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based? All right, so that's what we're going to um, anchor to as we move forward. Um, the structure, we're going to put a by when, a who, what will they do, at what proficiency level, and again we'll talk about that a little bit more in our data collection next week, and then you know what what supports might they need or in what situations to access that goal. I'm going to pass it over to Barbara to talk to us about standards. All right, <clears throat> so just thinking about aligning our goals to state standards, under the one system that we mentioned earlier, uh, reforming education to serve all students, students with individualized goals are to be aligned to Common Core state standards. So what does that mean and how do we do that?
So once you determine a student's area of need, you're going to find the standard that addresses it. And from there, you can think about how to build from present levels towards the grade level standard. Um, you want to make sure the goals are realistic and that they're based on present levels of performance and that they also set high expectations. Remember that several standards um, can align to the same goal. For example, if you're supporting standard two, which is a foundational reading skill, you may address two anchor skills such as close reading, close reading of text and determining central, uh, central ideas or key themes within one goal. And that will both support that foundational reading skill area. So aligning within the scaffold, I think that sometimes special education teachers think that, oh, I have a student in eighth grade, they need a writing goal. These are the writing goals at the eighth grade level. But when you look at what the student is currently able to do in terms of present levels, that goal is not necessarily appropriate. So you want to find a way to meet the standard by looking at the essence of the goal and making sure that the goal meets the students' current levels and moves them towards that grade level standard. Um, I guess, I, can you actually go back? I wanted to say one more thing, I think about that. So just, just a reminder, if you look at the standards, it's a progression of skills along a continuum. And when you're writing goals for your students, you wanna align each student's present levels and targeted goals within the scaffold standards. So this allows you to address the essence of the grade level standard while meeting the current needs of the student. So, and I sort of said this before, but if a student's not currently able to write at a grade level standard, do not write the goal at the grade level, but instead at the appropriate entry point within the scaffold to move them towards that grade level skill that you want them to have. Um, and then we wanna talk a little bit about technology within the standards. We didn't, you know, we don't tend to necessarily assess for technology in our um, eligibility assessments or necessarily in our discrete assessments, but technology is part of our common core state standards. So in order to support college and career readiness for students, connections to technology in the real world is essential. Uh, we need to take thoughtful and strategic actions to include technology in the classroom. So remember uh, the embedded technology standards when you are assessing students and writing goals. Um, we need to include technology competencies. So for example, the ELA literacy anchor goal uh, asks students to be able to integrate and evaluate information presented in diverse media formats. And there's a writing anchor standard that says students will use the internet to produce and publish writing. So if you give a student a paragraph writing goal, you could then ask them to publish or produce that using technology. And that way you're meeting two different standards with one goal, which meets the need of the student to develop their writing. Um, Next slide. Uh, also want to make sure that you're aware of the standards for career ready practice. As we just discussed, goals may be aligned, must be aligned to California standards. We want to make sure that you're aware of the CDE standards for career ready practice, which are a valuable resource for academic transition and career technical education for all students. After determining an area of need, consider if a career ready practice standard addresses it. So remember, several standards can align to the same goal. So for instance, um, communicate clearly, effectively, and with reason, which is the second bullet point, you could attach that to a goal for a job interview. That's a, that's a writing goal. Um, you could also align uh, with a goal to use speech to text when writing as well as a goal to use a timer app 
to support work completion. I think there's one more I was going to say, but I think I lost it. Can you go back to one more? Yeah. So in all these, there are 12 California Department of Ed standards for career ready practice. They're linked on our Padlet. As I just mentioned, career ready practice standards can also be used to define transition needs for successful post-secondary transition education, work, and independent living. But they can also be used for academic, functional, and daily living skills. So another example from this one is um, you could link a school behavior regulation goal as well as a goal to learn workplace expectations. So the standard allows opportunities for students to practice and gain mastery of fundamental knowledge and skills that are cross disciplinary and these standards can be used with any grade level. Uh, and one just one last time remember several standards can align to the same goal. Okay, so jumping back to our case studies, um, we're going to get into exactly how we would create SMART goals out of the goal areas that we determined we wanted to prioritize with our students. So we're going to start with Susie. And we are going to, we determined that the goal area or areas are blending sounds and high frequency words. Um, and emphasis on these will increase her fluency, which we know was an area of weakness without needing to write a separate goal for that. And we talked about that when we were annotating with all those awesome ideas for accommodations. So let's see how we would write this SMART goal for Susie. So next slide. Okay, so the basic format for an IEP goal is we wanna answer by when, who will do what, at what level of proficiency and under what conditions. So by March, 2021, who, Susie, will verbally blend in each opportunity for three consecutive weeks with 90% accuracy based on teacher records, given a novel list of 10 short vowel words containing a mix of CVC, CCVC, CVCC, and VC patterns. And I'm so glad I didn't stumble over that because I usually do. So that's how we would break it down into all of those mini boxes. And then we turn all of those mini boxes into one long, crazy sentence, right? When we create our goals. So the next slide will show it as the long sentence written out. Next slide. Yeah, so Susie's annual IEP goal, same thing I just read aloud, but in that long sentence formation. Um, and we've hit all of those SMART criteria here when writing this goal. Um, so we wanna ask ourselves just to double check, is this a SMART goal? Is it specific? Is it measurable? Is it attainable? Is it relevant? And is it time-based? So we can use this as a checklist to review the goals after writing them. Um, but if we tend to use that kind of um, sentence frame, that structure on the previous slide, then we're pretty well you know, set that this is a SMART goal. Let's check out the next slide and see. Um, okay, well, actually this slide. So providing the link to California standards. So the goal area was blending um, and the related standard areas are foundational skills and possible standards are at the first grade level. So um, I think your name is Kevin. He was talking about this in the chat and Cecilia and I were going back and forth answering him and maybe some more of you guys had this question, but it is absolutely okay to make Susie's goal, remember she's a third grader at a grade level lower than third grade if that's where she's performing at her independent level. And we know based off of both our um, formal assessment scores and our informal assessment scores that she's not performing this at a third grade level. So we would create goals written at a lower grade level and that is okay. Cecilia was mentioning in the chat with Kevin that many of the standards you can do backward looping to make sure that it's the same standard but at the lower grade level. So for Susie, 
the grade level would be a first grade level and it would be RF 1.2 point D with prompting and support produces single syllable words by blending phonemes. So the next slide kind of shows you, let's see the next one, a visual um, on the IAP. So you guys recognize this from SACE from the goal page that if you are creating a goal that's not at your student's grade level, you have different options of different boxes you can check and you can check that it is out of grade level. Um, and next up. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about reading. I think this question has come up uh, in the chat and also with uh, Joey's uh, case study student, which is um, what to do about reading, um, especially if you have a high, you know, an older student who's in middle school and high school who's reading at first grade level, second grade level, or third grade level, how do you write an appropriate goal for them? Um, this came up a lot for me personally in my previous practice where I was running a, a reading clinic um, for Oakland Unified School District and we would have these referrals that would come in and we'd have to write IEP goals to get them into the program and often Oftentimes there were middle schoolers and high school or high schoolers who were, you know, reading at second grade level or first grade level. And I'd have to write appropriate IEP goals for them in order to accept them into my program um, based on the reading level. So how would I sort of um, navigate that? Um, if you go to the next slide, Tara, um, so what are the things um, that you'll know, notice about the not only the standards, but also about how you, uh, like Joey said, there is a workaround where you can sort of check the, um, you know, it's, it's about their student's IEP um, and disability. And that's the reason why the goal may not exactly align to their grade level. Um, but in the K-5, you're gonna have, uh, you know, decoding and word recognition um, that link to students' foundational reading skills. Um, but then again, you may have a middle school or a high school who doesn't have those foundational reading skills, right? Who need them um, to really build up their skills um, and sort of access the curriculum. Um, so again, this is like where it says no and apply grade level phonics or word analysis skills and decoding or isolation text. Um, it's gonna be an important piece there. So that can cover you from K to five. And like uh, Cecilia was saying in the chat, you can backwards chain it if you go to the next slide um, to your students who are in middle school and high school. Um, if you go to the next one. Um, um, so if it's if it's in sixth through twelfth grade, again, it's going to be the standards are divided into reading literature. Um, so reading informational text. Um, again, so even if the student is, is working on reading informational text, but they still don't know how to decode, um, you can work it that they're they're still working on their decoding skills and write a goal that way and either check that um, it's appropriate based on their disability, or you know find a way within the standard. And if you come to my uh, executive functioning training, I go through how you can look at the standards and sort of find linguistically how to make um, connect them um, to make sure that the goals are appropriate and um, you know sort of meet the, the strict you know strict, uh, strict not strict but uh, you know can meet the needs of your students but also are defensible and um, attainable and also um, so, sort of uh, I'm having a word finding issue here but uh, um, challenging enough to, to meet their needs and I see there's a lot of questions here yeah, Daniel, there's a lot of questions about, you know, the administration saying they need to write goals at grade level, mm -hmm. especially around reading or read write, uh, re reading or word reading. And then also the question about if we write a goal to a much lower standard than their current grade level, is that considered a modification? What, you want to tackle that? <laughs> Um, so, and, and Joey and Cecilia Barbara jumped in here too. So I would say if your administration for whatever reason is giving you the directive that your goals need to be aligned at grade level, um, because the standards, especially in ELA are so linear, so they really are building upon each other. You can um, say you're writing a comprehension goal or even a word reading goal. You find the goal that is kind of, is the current grade level um, that standard and then identify what skill is scaffolded or, or the building block to meeting that grade level standard. So if you're really being told to, that it needs to be written in a seventh grade standard, don't write the student will comprehend seventh grade text if they're not able to do that. But you can say, you know, they are going to, you know, comprehend second grade text as a building block or something like that or, or yeah. read. 
So adding to what Tara is saying, when you backwards loop the standard, you're still working towards the grade level standard, even though they're working out of grade level. So you're still addressing that seventh grade standard, even though they're working at a lower level than that. So it's still aligned to the grade level standard because you're following that essential strand, but it's not that they're always using seventh grade material or that your goal is to get them to a seventh grade level. We know that that's not attainable. So um, you can link it to the grade level without actually writing it at the grade level. Um, and you always wanna follow your district guidelines. I'm gonna jump in as well um, <clears throat> to piggyback off Cecilia. I just one more time added the Padlet link into the chat box. And if you scroll through the Padlet link, um, under my area of mild moderate, there's a bunch of different uh, sources of information there, but there are two sources of information that I've attached for you guys to either view or view and download. You can print them out, but they're really, really good links to um, different PDFs that have that backward looping, that backward mapping, so that if you do, for example, have an eighth grader, you can see exactly how that standard would backward loop all the way to the kindergarten level. So go to that Padlet, check it out, and look at those two resources. Um, under the mild moderate section and they're towards the bottom there and it's labeled so you'll see exactly where to go. And there's a comment in the chat from Kathy, Kathy that saying that we're not just copying and pasting the language from the standard. That's exactly right. So just because you're aligning to a standard does not mean that your the goal is the standard. So the goal that you're going to write is going to identify the specific prioritized area of need um, within comprehension or decoding or writing, whatever it might be, and it aligns to the standard. But we do see that a lot where the standard is just written in. And if the student could just could, could just meet the grade level standard, then they wouldn't need an IEP goal for it. So we're aligning to by identifying the area within. Um, yeah, and SECO, there's a yeah, comment about SECO has some good um, supports there for that. This is an area definitely that we see a lot of, a lot of mixed information and a lot of concern. And that's why we also added the workshop next weekend where we can really talk, or next weekend, wow, next week on Wednesday, uh, where we can really have some time to talk more specifically about uh, specific situations. So Here, I one more thing I'm going to jump in. Sorry to cut you off, but I see Heather and some other people are talking about SACE goal banks. And then we've mentioned this SACO document um, for anyone and everyone coming on Monday, March 15th to the mild mod goal writing uh, breakout session. I'm going to be covering all of that stuff there. So um, we'll be going into a lot more detail about that as well on the 15th. Yeah, and Gold Bank, no matter what Gold Bank it is, is a huge like caution, caution. Just make sure that you're using it in an individualized. And Joey, again, we'll talk about that. Um, can you, Celeste, give us an example? What exactly are you asking for some more clarity um, for in the chat? And one of us can answer that as well. So we'll jump over to Ellen here. Um, and Ellen remembers a fifth grade student who has autism, has some behavior difficulties. Also, we've identified some math problem solving, word problem, uh, answering word problems, and place value for her, as well as blending sounds. So as you can see here, we have three or four different goal areas that kind of uh, cover everything that we found in our assessment for Ellen. So we'll give one example here of a goal um, that is for Ellen. And what I did here was showed how we can actually take an academic standard and also add in some of the behavioral components to it. So Ellen will complete real life word problems without exhibiting frustration behavior. So um, throwing paper, yelling, or leaving class. So this is actually asking her to do two pretty complex things, answer the word problems and do that without being frustrated. You could very easily pull these apart as well. Um, in 80% of observed opportunities, at least one week apart. So I you know, we'll talk about this in goal writing or data collection next time. But usually we want to write our criterion or our um, level of ma our mastery criteria for goals that shows that a student can and can demonstrate something over a period of time. So not just one time, um, but so we're saying here at least one week apart as measured by her work samples, but we're also going to have to have observation data collected. So two components there. Uh, and that's going to be when she's given five words 
word problems with no more than two steps and access to strategy reminders like keyword definitions and deep breathing. So those are those accommodations. I think that this under what conditions part is left out of our goals a lot, uh, but we did all that assessment and we really want to set the student up to be able to attain this goal. So she needs those things those accommodations to be present in order to expect her to essentially answer the, the math problems. And again, we're showing how we could put these two together. You could just as easily write a goal for completing math word problems and a goal for, you know, remaining calm or a decrease in, you know, that frustration behavior, but you can do it together. So I won't read it all to you, but that's this goal here is putting all of that information together in one, like Joey said, a super long sentence. So let's check and see if it is a smart goal. So is it specific? There's a, a couple of different things you could grab to, to say something is specific, but we're saying that she's going to answer five real life word problems. So that's very specific. Is it measurable? We have 80% of observed trials. And I always put of observed trials when it's something behavioral, especially uh, because there's no way that you can observe all opportunities. So if you're just, you know, when you are collecting data, and so in my classroom, we had specific times during the day and the week where behavior data was collected on a schedule. So those were our observed opportunities that we collected our data from at least one week apart. And is it attainable? Yes, because our discrete assessment showed that she can do the math, the adding, subtracting, the multiplying. So she has the, the base uh, baseline skills that she needs to answer the um, word problems and she can solve word problems when she has support. So we know that this is an attainable goal, relevant because we're um, attaching it to real life word problems that are applicable to future career as uh, Barbara was talking about, a student with autism. So I'm always thinking about, is this functional? Is this meaningful? Can she use this uh, in her life? And the answer here would be yes and time-based by March. Uh, so I think it's good sometimes to go back and really just provide yourself a little check to make sure that all of those pieces are there. Can And this is defensible. Can you justify all of the letters within our SMART structure? And if the answer is yes, then you have a great measurable defensible goal. Uh, so then we wanna hit this issue of linking to the standards that I know everyone is so interested in. So the goal area would be word problems. It's related to, and we could relate any one goal to multiple standards, as uh, Barbara said multiple times as well. So here we can show maybe it's related to numbers and operations um, and the possible fifth grade standard. So I took the opposite approach here instead of going down to maybe where she is functioning, maybe more at a third grade level, we can say that she is, this is a, a backward loop or a scaffold towards solving real life word problems of all the multiplication of fractions and mixed numbers. But Tara, she's not you didn't say anything about fractions and big numbers, right? She's not there yet. But when we know, when we think about what is the progression of getting to that, we're gonna work on multiplication. We're gonna work on solving multiple steps. That's where she is right now. And so we know that as we work towards or closer to the goal, we would start to add in fractions or mixed numbers. So that's how you can do it the opposite direction, aligning it to a current grade level. All right, so we're going to look at Jose here and determining the, the goal areas, right? We talked about his task initiation, his uh, ability to begin working on, on a task when when I said, okay, ready, set, go, and also um, actual writing a paragraph. Um, so those were determined uh, two goal areas that we're going to look at. Um, if you want to go into the next one. Um, so here's where we get to writing the goal. So by March 2021, um, Jose will compose one complete paragraph of five or more sentences um, within 10 minutes, when we talk about the level of proficiency, three out of four days a week as measured by his work samples. Um, and then again, under what conditions during language arts journal time, given a topic, a timer and positive verbal recognition for getting his materials out. So as a teacher, I wanna sort of support him in the initiation, but I wanna see him actually do the writing. Um, so getting his stuff together and then beginning and writing the sentence, you know, um, of one or more, of five or more sentences. Um, go on to the next one. So then we want to see, oh, here's his, his goal, right, uh, overall. Um, and we want to see if it's a smart goal. So is it specific, right? He wants to compose a, a paragraph of five or more sentences. Is it measurable, right, within 10 minutes uh, for three out of four days a week, um, since we're doing journaling every day, um, you know, 
when we look at our, our baseline data for him, is it attainable that he can do it once or twice a week, uh, each week, but we want him to level up on um, how often he's providing the same level of output. Um, Greg, is it relevant? We do journal running every day. It's, it's related to his personal interests. And then is it time-based? Yes, it will be by March, 2021. Uh, go ahead for the next one. And then um, linking to the standards. Um, and again, uh, he's a seventh grader, but he's may not be, like Tara said, he may not be writing um, per, you know, at seventh grade level. But again, the seventh grade standard produced clear and coherent writing in which the development organization and style are appropriate to task, purpose, and the audience, right? That's the goal we want to work him for, but we need to work on his initiation and also his composition. So within that, you know, we're gonna be working on his grammar, his spelling, all those components of the writing, but the goal is to write the paragraph. Um, so again, we're, we're working on not only sentence, uh, writing and form and function, but also getting towards the goal of a, com a composed paragraph, um, topic sentence and supporting sentences. Go on. We're talking on Gabriel now, and we honed in onto the functional time and money, but we wanna go ahead and triangulate that with his post-secondary goals. So we remembered he will be transitioning out of high school. So we wanna make sure those are overlap some form. So the goal that we have for him is utilizing dollar up on the next page. Thank you. So here we have utilizing the dollar up system. Remember, we have to make sure we have that baseline because we wanna make sure this is a defensible goal and we already know um, he can identify coins and dollars. He can identify them, he just wasn't able to apply them. So this is an upcoming skill. So he is utilizing dollar up and we have a, um, Proficiency level, the six to eight, and in three different settings, again, under what conditions. We want to make sure we're very specific about that. We don't want the student to be just applying their skills in the classroom. Hand me this, hand me that. That's that's not motivational. That's it's not applicable to real life situations. So we really want to take it out into the environment and let's do it. Let's, let's bring it on and make sure that they're being successful and they're being able to generalize this skill in different environments. Um, the next paragraph, excellent. So here you're going to have his Goal written now, and again at the bottom, you're going to see his post secondary goal, um, what he's going to be utilizing the skill with. Here, we're going to go ahead and cross reference with our SMART goal to make sure it's defensible. And defensible is definitely one of those things you want to be um, there and to show that it's uh, upholdable in court, really. So, you want to make sure it's defensible, and also it's, it's great for the students. So, that way, you're actually keeping them accountable, keeping yourself accountable. Um, so his goal is specific because we know exactly what we're going to dollar up. Um, you could actually specify one to 10 if you really want to be a little bit more specific in that. It is measurable. It's from six out of eight trials for three successful weeks. Again, we want to make sure we, there's consistency so we know he has mastered this skill. And here we have attainable. Um, we already know he can count the money. He doesn't apply it yet, but it is attainable. This is a goal that we could reach for. We, and we don't want him to flatline. We want to keep reaching for more and more and keep working at it. It is relevant because we still take cash on buses. And in some areas, they still take cash. Um, if you really want to make it really irrelevant today, you might want to teach them, you know, a plastic card and tapping. <laughs> and this is time-based for one year. And I think also, I think what we had at the last goal was um, the condition. The condition would be at a bus stop, maybe at a coffee shop, and then initially, you know, in the classrooms, so you want to make sure you know where you're going to be doing this particular task. All right, next slide. So we're in reference to um, providing the link to California State Standard here for Gabriel. So this is a defensible goal. We've already checked it with SMART. It is defensible. That's great. But does it meet the grade level standard? He's working, if you make it towards money, money and time isn't really grade level for 11th grade or second grade. We could go ahead and backward loop it like some of us mentioned, right? So we're scaffolding up to the grade level standard or next slide, please. So what you can do on uh, this is form, there's actually four different choices here. I'm um, gonna enable students to be involved um, in general education, addresses other educational needs, linguistically appropriate, or it's transitional, meaning that it's going to be related to their educational training, employment, or independent living. So you have these different options to choose. For Gabriel, I would actually be choosing transition because this is great for employment, independent living, and training, depending on what his goals were. Again, we want to go back to um, 
our assessments to determine what his person-centered desires are. Next slide. So again, I would be focusing on the, for him, transitional goals. So as long as uh, you have some goals that are focused on his grade level standards, it's okay to choose one of these other four choices. But again, you need to follow your district's choice and you do have options based on your assessment and what the student's needs are. And that takes us to our next option, time given. All right, you guys, what we wanted to do to wrap up today's training, um, before we thank you guys all for coming and participating and all that fun stuff, we are going to quiz you guys. Um, we wanted to use Kahoot. Some of you have probably been using this for months or possibly years or possibly this is brand new to you. So whoever you are and whatever stage you're at, we're gonna try it. So if you guys could please open up your browser, go to www.kahoot.it and then enter the game pin. I just put it in the chat box and then enter your name. Now, this is a good thing I wanna note for your students as well. You do not have to enter your real name. If you wanted this to be anonymous so your students didn't feel so much pressure or it would help them participate more if people didn't know what their answers were, they could enter a nickname, they could enter a number, they could enter a symbol, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you guys wanna go on, kahoot.it, enter the game pin, it's 844-4354 and then enter your name and we'll get started. I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna do a Kahoot to see how well you can answer smart goal writing. All right, let's do this. Hold on. I also have some fun music we can listen to while we get ready for our Kahoot. All right, let me share my screen. Thumbs up if you guys can see my screen. Awesome. There's a lot of you guys joining. Thumbs up if you can hear my tunes. Oh, I know you can. I see your heads bobbing. <laughs> People are coming in. There's a lot of you. I love it. Give it another 10 seconds or so to let you guys join. If you can't join, no worries. You can still hopefully see the screen and see what we're going over. Join the Kahoot jams while we wait. I am gonna, as we get to the questions in just another few seconds, I'm gonna read them out loud um, so that everyone can hear them as well. All right, Goal Symposium SMART Goals. Here we go. The first quiz question, what does the S in SMART stand for? Is it smart, specific, strategic, or simple? There's five seconds left. Choose your best answer. <laughs> All right, specific, good. Specific was the, the correct. My Mine kept going in a circle. I mean, it was trying to boot up. Okay, let's try Yeah, mine wasn't working either. Still loading? Yeah, loading. Okay, true or false? The M in SMART stands for measurable, true or false. Now with Kahoot, if you don't already know, you can choose how much time you wanna give your students to answer the questions. Um, you can choose more time, you can choose less time. 87 people said true. Good, you were right, 87 of you, nice. Look at Bonbon bon in the lead. Go Bonbon. Bon. Shit nudes coming up though. 
All right, number three out of eight. What does the A in SMART stand for? Is it awesome, awful, abominable, or attainable? Please get this one right. Seven seconds left. <laughs> nice, 90 of you. I love that one person who said a bomb. <laughs> All right. Chick noodle, chick noodle caught up. Um, so you guys can see it's fun, it's engaging. Number four, the R in SMART stands for rigorous, true or false. So this was also a fun way to check your understanding, but more so it's just a fun way to give an example and show a way to interact, a real informal assessment to work to use with your kids at the end of a lesson. So we wanted to try it with you. The R in SMART stands for rigorous, false. Does not stand for rigorous, rigorous. All right, still in the lead, Chuck Noodle. Five out of eight, what does the T in SMART stand for? Technical, traditional, time-based, or time-lapse? Three, two, one. Time-based, nice, good job. T in SMART is time-based. <clears throat> hey, Laura's coming up, Chick Noodle. Get ready. True or false, number six of eight. Several standards can align to the same goal. True or false? I love this little girl in this picture. <laughs> she makes me laugh every time. I love it. Three seconds. Several, several standards can align to the same goal. True, good job. All right, let's see here, seven out of eight. We only have two left. Our ultimate job as educators is to prepare students for their TikTok account, current level of academic proficiency, their next environment or their current environment. Let's see how many of you are big TikTokers out there. Good, none of you. <laughs> Their next environment. All right, nice. Chick Noodle is still in the lead. And our last and final question, eight out of eight is true or false. Thank you for attending today's Goal Symposium. We will see you next Wednesday at Cecilia's um, workshop. Not our breakout sessions, that's the following week. Um, but will we see you next week at Wednesday from 1 to 3 at Cecilia's workshop? Time to get to work. We'll have breakout rooms. We're really excited. Will you be there? Let's find out. True. 72 of you. I'll take it. I'll take it. Those two of you, how can I convince you to come? <laughs> All right. Um, so that was just a fun way for us to engage students. Um, I'm going to stop my share at this point. And as we finish up here, um, just a reminder, here's all the links for all of our upcoming sessions. We received an email that had all of these in them as well. And then before you all leave, uh, we do have an evaluation for everyone to complete. And once you do that, we will send out a certificate. Uh, the link is in the chat, or you can scan the QR code that's uh, in your packet or a Guys, we came in under time. That never happens. Does anyone have any questions before we head out? Was the packet already sent out? I came in really late. It was. It went out in an email oh. uh, separate from the links. I will resend. Uh, all the, I should say all the materials for the next week and for the breakouts will be on the Padlet.
I want to give a quick shout out. You guys were so awesome in the chat box. Super um, attentive and engaging. And like Tara said, at the very first few minutes, you weren't all on yet, but so many of you had your cameras on and it was just fun to scroll through and see you guys. So thank you. I had a quick question in regards to, um, I am a high school resource specialist. And so um, in the upcoming breakouts and next week's training is at some point going to be addressed, like how do you write goals that are things that you may not specifically track in your own classroom? Like I see my students um, for one period a day and it's more focused on just like kind of work completion and more study skills, executive functioning. And so it becomes more challenging to write goals that I'm track. I'm not necessarily tracking information. I usually write them specific to the class that they're in, like their math class or their English class, things like that. So is that going to be part of like how do you write an IEP that you can, like you said, defensive defensible goals that you may not necessarily track yourself? Um, I, we can talk about it a little bit more in the data tracking and collection in terms of um, creating data sheets and ways to get the data from the other classrooms. I don't know if the other um, specialists have any exam or any other information, but I think that's how I would approach that. Yeah, I think uh, having worked at the secondary level, that's always a thing, right? Um, and having a system in place to communicate with the gen ed teachers where the student is working on the goals, but also that you have some system in place within your um, support time or lab or whatever you call it, where you're also checking on them is important. So hopefully that Tara will talk about that in her data collecting. Okay, wonderful. And also next week, Cecilia is giving a, a presentation for the first chunk of time and following her presentation, we're going to send you guys into breakout rooms where we will all be popping in and out with you guys to answer specific questions like that and kind of help you get through it. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. This was good. Good information. <laughs> Thanks. And, uh, and lots of questions about the recording. We will eventually get a recording up on the website. We are at the mercy of tech and access, just making sure everything is accessible. So it will take some time. When that is available on our website and or the Padlet, I will be sure, we will be sure to send out an email to alert everyone that it's been posted. And please fill out the evaluation. Please, 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 the link one more time here. Feedback, we're all open to feedback. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I hope to see you guys all next week. We'll have a lot of time to answer questions. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Thanks, everyone.